Good evening, and um, th thank you, of course, to the Tzvat family and, and to Dean Hecht. Allow me to welcome you both in person and um, virtually to the Clow Library, one of the world's foremost Judaica libraries and a most fitting venue to honor the intellectual legacy represented by the Tzvat Memorial Lecture. And building on the intellectual vitality hosted at the library, I will draw your attention, this is just for uh, uh, programmatically, to the upcoming Feld Lecture, Good Samaritans, Jewish Samaritan Relations in the Roman World, to be delivered by Stephen Fine on Monday, March 13th at 7 p.m. right here in the Cloud Library. And I invite you to investigate at your leisure the uh, exhibits featuring all of our lectures and events um, off behind me here. It is a distinct privilege to introduce Professor Dr. David Aaron. Educated at Brandeis, the Hebrew University, the University of Tübingen, he is now Professor of Hebrew Bible and the History of Interpretation here at the Hebrew Union College, the institution from which he received his ordination. Professor Dr. Aaron is the author of numerous scholarly articles, essays, and books on a variety of subjects too numerous to do justice to in this brief introduction. His academic career began with a thesis on grammars of Tanaitic Hebrew, which one eminent scholar has referred to as scintillating. And since that thesis, the scintillation has not waned. In addition to his many scholarly achievements, we can also include musician, playwright, librettist, novelist, raconteur, and I could go on, but I've been told that he doesn't do windows, so nobody's perfect. This evening's lecture is part of his forthcoming book, Subversive Principles, Philosophical Reflections on, on Mishnah Avot 1 through 2, chapters 1 through 2. So you see his mind at work, already thinking about a sequel. I know from personal and professional experience that he has very much taken to heart Ben Bagbag's admonition, hafachba v'hafachba, and while everything might not be in it, this lecture nevertheless promises to have a great deal to contemplate. And with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. David Aaron and this year's Svat Memorial Lecture, A New Look at an Old Book, Rethinking the Purpose of Pirkei Avot. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jordan. And I, I can add that that scintillating rabbinic thesis on Middle Hebrew grammar, no one has picked up on the film rights yet. So if you really would like to do that, just see me afterwards. I don't know if um, Dr. Katsu is in cyberspace with us at this moment, but we were part of an unusual rabbinic class which had uh, Matiti Tzvat as our teacher the moment we came back to Cincinnati from Jerusalem. We had the privilege of studying Tanakh with him in Hebrew. We asked for a class in Hebrew, and he immediately stepped up and volunteered. It was an absolutely extraordinary experience and unusual, because at that time, uh, Professor Tzvat mostly taught graduate students ancient Near Eastern literature, Hittite, Ugaritic, Akkadian, he did teach Tanakh quite a bit, but because most rabbinic students did not meet him when they first got here, not that many took classes with him. I took a class with him every single semester I was here. He had an indelible impact on my own ability to read uh, ancient Hebrew literature and beyond. He was actually magnificent with medieval Hebrew literature as well and was quite a musician. Tractate of Vote often called Pirkei Avot, or Chapters of the Fathers, is the only tractate of the Mishnah commonly published as a separate book. Like the Mishnah and Tosefta in general, the origins of Avot are shrouded in obscurity. When and by whom it was written is uncertain. We don't know why it is called Avot, since father or ancestor is not a salient concept in the anthology. In fact, this sense of avot is likely mistaken. One medieval commentator suggests that avot is a translation of the Greek concept of principles, 
as in the rabbinic hermeneutic rule known as binyan av, which could be translated as foundational principle. This fits beautifully with the notion that the book's purpose is to emulate a Greco-Roman philosophical fellowship's need to establish core ideological principles. While most scholars see Avot as having been included in the original Mishnah's anthology, ostensibly published around 200, its enigmatic character has led other scholars to suggest that it originated independently and was only subsequently associated with the Mishnah. Avot is comprised of aphorisms. Mostly, these maxims portray social and religious values. They are almost never discursive in the sense that discursive philosophy seeks to justify its ideas. No avot just proclaims. The tractate is universally considered normative wisdom literature. In fact, many scholars, secular and religious, have viewed avot as rabbinic Judaism's greatest contribution to world wisdom literature. In his 1951 Mishnah translation and commentary, Philip Blackman notes that, I'm quoting, the entire tractate is in comparatively simple, attractive language easily understood by the humblest Jewish reader and is of such paramount practical interest and supremely moral importance that it has been incorporated in the liturgy and is read on Sabbath afternoons during the summer months, end quote. Blackman and others make it rather straightforward. If you are in search of wisdom, study a vote. Jacob Neusner, in his book-length commentary on a vote, suggests that the sages wrote for, I quote, all time because they could transcend the cares and concerns of one time and place, end quote. In a nuanced study, Amram Troper writes that the intellectual streams of wisdom and Torah c- converge in a vote, although wisdom, he writes, now functions as the handmaiden for Torah. Now, my first experience of a scholarly, albeit mostly philological treatment of vote, of a vote was in a Mishnah class taught by T. Carmi on HUCJIR's Jerusalem campus. This was back in the 1970s, and some of my classmates, if they were reading, will undoubtedly remember the experience of studying a vote with Carmi. Today, when I read Blackman's sense of the language that the sense that the language of vote is, quote, comparatively simple, easily understood by the humblest Jewish reader, I am flabbergasted. Translating a vote under Carmi's rigorously scrutinizing watch was exceedingly more difficult than translating biblical wisdom literature such as Proverbs or Kohelet. Avot's aphoristic language is highly elliptical. To translate something well, you sort of have to understand it. But the meanings of Avot's aphorisms are at best vague and commonly elusive. It's really not at all, I'm really not at all sure what Blackman was thinking. I guess memory of that first experience translating Avot faded with time. Some 20 years ago, having written a dissertation on Midrash and published a number of long scholarly articles on rabbinic literature, I thought it would be a good idea to study a vote with my eldest son, Joshua, who was about to become bar mitzvah. He eagerly sat with me in my study, and we began making our way through the first chapter, at which point I realized I had no clue what most of these aphorisms actually meant. And then there were those that I and he understood only too well, such as altar besichai maisha, meaning more or less, don't talk with women. Quite a thing to espouse to your 12-year-old as a wise religious precept. We sat with a number of contemporary commentaries, each of which seemed less useful than the next. Eventually, 
we gave up and turned to a much easier text, Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed, stunningly lucid compared to a vote. That experience spawned my desire to write on a vote, but the project was postponed in order to bring other publishing commitments to press. Subversive principles, philosophical reflections on a vote one and two should appear by July of this year. Cover, it covers only the first two chapters of the tractate, or about 34 aphorisms. It's 200,000 words. It turns out that when it turns out that when read closely with historical critical tools, the encoded meanings of a vote, altogether hidden during a casual reading, are slowly, if only partially, exposed. A vote's meanings, often linked to arcane cultural values and practices, are impenetrable outside of their Greco-Roman context. As for containing what Neusner sees as transcendent aphorisms written for all time and places, well, such maxims prove to be far and few between, unless, of course, you are willing to entertain as desirable misogyny, the exploitation of disciples by a patriarchal hegemony, the suppression of free thinking, and the use of a divine economy to cajole ideological conformity through fines and punishments. So, what is a contemporary reader supposed to do? I will return to this specifically this question specifically at the end of my talk. But let's elucidate what a vote is first. This tractate was not originally composed to elucidate a uniquely Jewish form of wisdom for the masses. In effect, by making the book a popular read, the Jewish community violated Avot's reason for coming into being. This is most certainly not my original insight. Seth Schwartz, Jack Lightstone, and a handful of other scholars have made this point explicitly and repeatedly, a point which has mostly been ignored by those producing popular commentaries. A vote then was written for a very tight-knit community of men, of intellectuals, all of whom were rather wealthy. In Mishnah Sota 9.15, we read, Mi shemet Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah pasaka osha mina chachamim. When our master Elazar ben Azariah died, ah, wealth among the sages came to an end. This hints at a moment in history when the concept of the rabbinate shifted from an elite, wealthy fellowship toward a somewhat wider audience. Numerous passages in the Yerushalmi also reflect this transformation of the fellowship's membership by reframing Avot's collection of aphorisms this evening according to its historical context. I hope to be able to calibrate our expectations. This evening, I'm going to focus on Avot itself and not its reception or use later in history. The historical trajectory resulted in the misunderstandings that typify readings of Avot today. Avot's original audience was comprised of the Jewish, arist of Jewish aristocrats whose lives mimicked those of wealthy Greco-Roman elites, a class of people who prized philosophical banter and the reading of books in social forms. Again, it was exclusively men. After all, who else could have had time to sit around and contemplate intellectual matters other than those with the financial means to enjoy extended periods of leisure? One of the greatest pastimes in antiquity among the wealthy was the formation of fellowships. In Rome, these fellowships often met at the estates of wealthy individuals, some of whom derived great pride from amassing extensive personal libraries. What good is a library if you don't make known to others the wealth of your holdings? Some 38 private libraries have been documented in Rome at the beginning of the fourth century. William A. Johnson has studied extensively what he calls 
reading communities in antiquity. They were especially prominent in Greco-Roman cities of the Mediterranean. According to Johnson, these private groups served as, I quote, gatekeepers for social and intellectual circles, end quote, among the economic and political elite. Based on Jewish, Hebrew, and Aramaic sources, we get the impression that the earliest gathering of Jewish sages emulated these kinds of Greco-Roman reading communities, not the informal social groups that are documented in cities like Rome and Alexandria, but the more formalized groups that formed around specific philosophies of life, such as Stoics or Cynics or Epicureans. A vote makes explicit that a wealthy person should open his house generously and then sit at the feet of the sage, so that one might literally be figured and figuratively be covered by the dust at their feet. Philosophical fellowships regularly invited renowned itinerant sages to address their groups. The main entertainment was quite frequently the recitation from the manuscript. Avot's aphorisms were framed then to fashion the group's ideological principles and acculturate, acculturate new members of the closed fellowship into the ideological fold. The collection espoused the values, behaviors, and outcomes cherished by the author's community of literati. Today, when reading the tractate, we read the word rabbi as meaning just what it seems to mean in our language, but this is a gross misinterpretation. During the Greco-Roman period, there was no Jewish clergy, meaning in the post-temple period, in the sense of today's rabbis. The term, as Chaim Lappin has rather unequivocally demonstrated, was an honorific title that was used quite broadly and not only by the members of the fellowship responsible for what we today call rabbinic literature. As noted, most of Avot's proclamations are far from being universal gems of eternal, eternally valid wisdom. In fact, many of its aphorisms are outright disturbing both from the perspective of the ancient Jewish commoner and in terms of our contemporary ethical sensibilities. A vote is far more narrowly relevant to the general audience than the earliest wisdom writings of the Hebrew Bible, or Ben Sira, penned during the early 2nd century BCE. A vote's wisdom requires that one fully buy into the system of zichut, of merit, that facilitates life in a future world. In contrast, the beliefs required to make sense of proverbs, for instance, were commonly found among multiple ethnic groups of the ancient Near East. Proverbs then seeks to elucidate universal principles. Avot, not so much. The stellar scholarship of Henry Fischel back in the 1970s demonstrated the reliance of numerous rabbinic maxims, parables, and stories upon the Greco-Roman literary sources. Perhaps more significant than these literary influences is evidence of social conventions and intellectual attitudes imported by Avot's author. This even includes the character of ideological conflict among clusters of sages. According to Adriel Schwemmer, internecine tensions are evident in Avot's first two chapters reflecting common philosophical agreements among late Hellenistic philosophical schools. Arguably, arguably the most polemicized group among the Greco-Roman philosophical fellowships were the Epicureans, which is noteworthy because this is the only group from among the non-Jewish fellowships explicitly mentioned by name in Avot. I will return to the importance of the Epicurean fellowship at the end. They're often called, or when referred to in other literature, they're called the garden, because ostensibly they had their philosophical discourse while sitting in the garden. And you should know that multiple documents indicate that the Epicureans admitted both women and slaves, I'm not sure which is more radical, to their philosophical discourse. 
I would like to spend the rest of my time with you shedding light on just two popular aphorisms. I'm going to provide the aphorisms without the attributions recorded in a vote. Attributions, that is the ascribing of a saying to a particular sage, are fundamental to all rabbinic literature. But a discussion of the attributions in a vote would take us into a conversation that would leave us no time to focus on the aphorisms themselves. Let's just focus on the wisdom component and not the politics. I'll provide for you the translations of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs and Philip Blackman, and then recommend alternative meanings. So given that we are at HUC and we have both rabbinic students and graduate students, it seems rather obvious that we needed to discuss this aphorism. Black Sachs translates, get yourself a teacher, acquire a companion, and give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And Blackman translates, procure thyself a teacher, acquire unto thyself an associate, and judge all men in the scale of merit, he then adds in a footnote, that means charitably. Now, the majority of aphorisms in chapters one and two are comprised of three stitches. When the three-stitch structure is violated, we should recognize editorial meddling. This aphorism is perfectly structured. With both of these trans, while both of these translations sound reasonable on the surface, neither enables us to recognize the rather technical meaning of three words, kne, chaver, and zechut. Let's start with the use of the honorific rav. This can convey honor to a teacher, but in the present context, the meaning is specifically master. Thus, I would translate, establish for yourself a master. Even though the relationship has to do with the learning fellowship's membership, that's not the core concern of this maxim. The requirement that a person wishing to enter the fellowship be subordinate to a master is made absolutely explicit in Avot 1.3. Best rendered, do not be like those servants who serve their masters in order to receive their rations. Yes, paras means food rations and not prize or reward, as Maimonides would make popular. And Rav in that ver in that maxim, most definitely does not mean God, but a human master. So the whole point here is that you, as someone desiring to become a member of the elite fellowship, can only do so by starting at the bottom. First, you establish a master-servant relationship, which has important financial implications related to service, and then you seek out someone else who is at your own level. This subservient structure emulates Greco-Roman practice quite thoroughly. Seth Schwartz writes that disciples were, I quote, expected to reciprocate in exchange for learning with personal service of their master, end quote. The only way to enter the fellowship was by doing service to someone you recognized as your master and who accepted you as a servant. While it is true that there is an intellectual exchange taking place, we need to emphasize that everyone involved in these types of fellowships was concerned with analyzing, expounding, and questioning ideas. That's the social and intellectual purpose of the early fellowships, Jewish and pagan. But the specific relationship defined here is about subordination and service to facilitate entry into the elite group. You must pay your dues. 
I do not have the time to fully ex explicate the meaning of chaver, terribly complicated word in the earliest rabbinic literatures. In tractate Demai, the word chaver connotes a member of the group that meticulously observes the rules of tithing. That's not the concern here. The word can just mean friend. In the present context, however, it is a much more technical connotation, perhaps something like associate, a person who is to serve as both a study partner and a classmate of sorts, all aware, both people being aware or the group being aware of their master's needs. This concept of chaver, which would be the equivalent of the Greco-Roman amikitia, has a very technical meaning. That technical meaning is signaled by the word kuf nun he, kene. The concept of kene as entailing monetary acquisition should be understood literally rather than figuratively. There were formalized friendship acquisition rituals dating back to ancient Greece. The theme is traced quite thoroughly by Professor Gabriel Hermann, Tel Aviv University, in his fine book, Ritualized Friendship and the Greek City. The acquisition of a chaver, really acquisition, money exchanges involved in Greek and Roman context entailed an elaborate ritual that involved gifts, one-upsmanship, and explicit statements about obligations. These formalized rituals were, I quote, crucial to the workings of ancient society, writes Hermann, as both Cicero and Seneca, among others, inform us. Thus, it is not simply by chance that the sages used a word that implies a financial exchange. Rather, we are speaking of highly formalized relationships among chaverim, who are collaboratively and loyally serving masters. These associations involve the performance of mutual services, but they could also eventually pass out of existence when the terms of the service expired. As Sandra Marchetti frames it, these relationships were predominantly pragmatic rather than effectual. Thus, the Hebrew, kuf nun he, here to buy, really is about a financial transaction or a kind of gift giving that signifies commitment through the exchange of valuables. If you recognize that this entire aphorism is about a formalized exchange system, the meaning of that last phrase becomes rather clear. One is to judge those available to be either a master or a study accomplice on the basis of their zechut. This word, often translated as merit, exceeds all of the other words of this aphorism combined in terms of semantic complexity. I will barely touch the surface here, but for sure, the idiom has a technical connotation, and it is not grant benefit of the doubt, a meaning you might assume in later non-technical historical texts. Here we are being told that one's choice of master and study partner should be based on the concept of merit assessment. I hope the students are listening, which will then influence the acquisition and exchange process that is central to rabbinic Judaism. Neusner speaks of the Mishnah as being based on a divine economy in which the currency used by the sages was specifically this thing called zichut. In Pierre Bourdieu's terminology, this would be the single most valued form of social and intellectual capital, which functioned as a currency able to secure life in the world to come, by life in the world to come. As such, an evaluative judgment takes place whenever one needs to establish a master or a study partner. Merit is earned through the honor given and received among peers, 
the esteem and overall scholarly accomplishment of the fellow disciple or sage must be granted on the basis of the merit they have already accumulated. Lechaf zechut. It's not abstract. You take a measure. The maxim employs aspects of the exchange system that foster functional relationships among those within the network of disciples and masters. You should choose to become subservient to someone whose merit ratings are really high. It's sort of like rate my professor. Schlepperdick sages need not apply. The establishment of these relationships are actions fully accounted for within the exchange system that functions behind all rabbinical transactional relationships. Judging the value of such potential exchanges should take place according to the person's intellectual and social capital. Make sure you acquire a relationship of high value. 60% of the aphorisms in the first two chapters of a vote alone concern themselves directly with the economy of exchange. The theme is very much present in chapter three as well. As noted, Neusner calls this the divine economy. In a vote, this economy exists exclusively as a marketplace of exchange among sages and their disciples. End of story. That is, in this early stage of rabbinic literature, acquisition of zechut is not universally open to whoever might seek it. This will change in Amoraic literature, but in Avot, anything involving an exchange of zechut does not enjoy universal relevance. This is a highly particularistic form of intellectual and social capital. We might then paraphrase the meaning of this aphorism as follows. Subordinate yourself to a master so that you might eventually enter the elite fellowship of sages. Facilitate an exchange ritual with an associate so as to formalize a financial and intellectual commitment to a fellow disciple in service of a master. Calculate the expenditures in your exchange on the basis of each individual's accrued intellectual and social capital. Wow. Imagine, dear students, if you had to establish your relationships at HUC with your professors and colleagues with these calculations in mind. The next aphorism I wish to consider is somewhat related to Avot 1.6, albeit not in an obvious way. Not in an obvious way. This would be Avot 1.14. Translations vary very little, so I'm only offering you Rabbi Jonathan Sachs's rendering. Im ein anili mili, chshani alatzmi mani, vim lo chshav ematai. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So simple, huh? In the Sachs Angel Commentary, we read, a healthy, well-balanced personality seeks to, I'm quoting now, a healthy, well-balanced personality seeks to blend self-respect and respect for others. Judaism does not demand self-abnegation. It recognizes the right and obligation of each person to maintain personal dignity. Remember that word, the right. Striking the proper balance is essential if one is to, emphasis now, live a religiously upright life. A religiously upright life. End quote. Avigdor Shin'am places greater emphasis on the tension between the individual and the community. Thus, he interprets, I'm now, this is my translation of his Hebrew commentary, if I do not worry about myself regarding my rights, my rights and my own welfare, who will be concerned with such things for me? Zichuyot and 
litovati, he says. The answer, Shinan suggests, is clear. No one will be. Aside from the fact that no one writing a vote would ever have imagined the concept of rights in the way we use this word, that goes for both Shin'an and Angel's commentary, the aphorism does, not, does, does appear to stress an individual's responsibility for their own destiny, at least on the surface. Despite the relative reasonableness of most interpretations, no one, not a single commentator I read while reading or writing my book, and that's about 60, no one starts by recognizing just how astoundingly radical this maxim is for early Judaism. In fact, it is so radical, it feels decidedly non-Jewish. And as it turns out, the rabbis drew the concept conveyed in this pithy saying rather directly from contemporary Greco-Roman cultural developments. Moreover, these developments were especially prominent among the Epicureans. What is utterly remarkable is just how attuned the rabbis were to cultural developments in Roman society. Often the radical of, radicalness of this maxim is overlooked, or I should speculate that the radicalness of this maxim is overlooked because interpreters are so accustomed to the concept of individuality today that they don't hear the strangeness of this aphorism. I'm suggesting that a reader from the original generation of Avot's devotees would have found this aphorism utterly shocking. Reflect on the words and ask yourself whether anything in this phrase pertains to Judaism in any way whatsoever. Is Torah implied? Is association with the sages indicated? Is there anything in this phrase that makes you feel as if you're still in a tractate of the Mishnah? This aphorism is devoid of anything we would associate with the divine. The phrase is comprised of words about a person's self and temporality. There are no other principles explicitly at work. Now, since the Enlightenment, Westerners have developed very sophisticated senses of the individual as an autonomous self. But for the common person, in contrast to the elite, during Greco-Roman times, there was no such consciousness either of the individual or of religion as something personally crafted. Nothing in this phrase, explicitly or implicitly, signals a concern for merit or any aspect of the afterlife. Why in the world is this aphorism here? An explanation for this aphorism's inclusion comes to light with the consideration of Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality. The subtitle of the third volume is The Care of the Self. This volume offers an effective key for understanding the cultural background to this rabbinic maxim. Foucault believes that the principle of caring for oneself, which can first be documented around the time of Plato, eventually became a, I quote, truly general cultural phenomenon in the late Greco-Roman conceptual structure. The concept is foundational to the principles of how one should live. Foucault related to this concept of self and self-care as initially peculiar to the elite, the highly educated sectors of Greek and later Roman society. The commoner would never have had such an idea. They would never have understood such an idea, principally, be, principally because such ideas require substantial financial resources, providing the practitioner with time to contemplate things unrelated to subsistence. Foucault considers the emergence of the idea of the self and then self-care as a significant development in the history of Western thought, one that would influence ways of thinking about everything from consciousness to principles of fairness well into the modern world. The concept 
of self-care, as it turns out, was integral to an Epicurean thought as well as multiple generations of Stoics, Zeno, Seneca, and especially Marcus Aurelius among them. Each of these thinkers adapted aspects of this principle to their own liking. Eventually, care of the self would also play a role among Christian theologians quite prominently, albeit with decidedly different connotations from those assumed among Epicureans and Stoics. A vote one four serves as an aphoristic summary of early Rabbinism's appropriation of the philosophical sense that caring for oneself was part of a value system that supported the life practices of a rabbinic fellowship. In effect, becoming a sage is about more than study and interacting with other sages. It is a pathway toward a radical self-conceptualization that would be very much at odds with what was conceptualized among commoners, the Mishnah's Am Haaretz. This is a concept for the elite, of the elite. Commoners need not bother with it. For the Epicureans especially, self-care means striving for self-mastery. This results from knowledge and practices that are meant to control one's desires so as to minimize suffering. Hence, it influences everything from perceptions of esteem and personal worth to the expression of a vast array of interpersonal values. Especially within Epicurean and Stoic thought, the core principles of self-care were to become, I quote, a permanent obligation for every individual th throughout their lives, end quote. That again is Foucault. The relationship between master and disciple was crucial to the furtherance of this obligation. The practice of self-care is learned incrementally. Ignorance of the world is rooted in ignorance of oneself. The practice starts with reflection on self within the guide with the guidance of a master. So important that self-realization must take place with the tutelage of a master. Foucault argues that for Epicurus, all forms of knowledge are grounded in self-knowing. Only through knowledge can one rid oneself of delusions. Epicurus was particularly concerned with the motivations for learning that were anchored in the desire for admiration and recognition. The Epicureans rejected the standard approach to education in Greek culture called paideia because they saw it as, I quote, a culture of boasters developed merely by concoctors of words whose own aim is to be admired by the masses, end quote. The educational process Epicurus pres prescribes is dominated by the concept of preparation. This is a commitment to readying an individual to take on any circumstance that comes along in life. Foucault explains it this way, the Epicurean concept of preparation is precisely what will make possible resistance to every impulse and temptation that may come from the external world. This form of life preparation, imenanilimili, this form of life preparation will enable one both to achieve one's aim and to remain stable, settled on this aim, not letting oneself be swayed by anything else. This means that one's education, one's preparation, one's learning has to, I quote, provide the soul with the necessary equipment for its struggle, for its objective, and its victory, end quote. The Epicureans even considered learning to care for the self not, excuse me, the Epicureans even considered learning to care for the self not as a solitary exercise, but as a true social practice. More advanced members of the philosophical community took it upon themselves to tutoring the others, either individually or in more collective fashion. Now, the fact that Foucault spends so much time analyzing the relationship of the Epicurean to self-care could not be more auspicious for someone seeking to decode Avot's aphorism. For this intense relationship, 
between self-care and the pedagogic environment of the sages appears to parallel that of the Epicureans. Foucault writes the care of the self or the attention one devotes to the self that others should take of themselves appears then as an intensification of social relations, end quote. This would appear to explain just why an aphorism on self-care is included among our avot aphorisms. Even the concluding phrase, if not now when, echoes the Epicurean mindset that there is no right age for attending to oneself. I quote, it is never too early nor too late to care for the well-being of the soul, writes Epicurus. The person who says that the season for this study has not yet come or has already passed is like the person who says it is too early or too late for happiness. I've actually only scratched the surface of the concept of self-care and its social implications. Implications one would never intuit, but with only are made possible, only made evident with awareness of the cultural context from which this aphorism emerged. I do not have time to elucidate the stunning mention of the Epicureans in Avot 2.14. I'll tempt you with it, though. There we read, Heve shakud l'ilmod Torah veda shetashiv l'apikoros. Be diligent in the study of Torah. Know how to answer a heretic. Or, according to Blackman, be assiduous in the study of the law and know what answer to give to the skeptic. Actually, this version of vote has been heavily reworked. Notice how far we are from the nice poetic three-stitch form that we had in our first, our first aphorism. The preferred reading of this aphorism is preserved in the oldest manuscripts of Avot, the Kaufman and the Parma versions, both from the 10th, maybe early 11th centuries. In the former, we read, and notice we have three nice, clean stitches. Be diligent to learn how you will respond to an Epicurean, right? No word Torah there. Know before whom you toil and know who is owner of your work. Apicorus does not mean heretic, and it certainly does not mean skeptic, as the translations I've shared show. But I am going to leave you with a cliffhanger and not actually expose the hidden purpose of this aphorism. I guess you're just going to have to buy the book if you're at all curious. My main point here is that the appearance of the Epicurean proves to be reliant on attitudes toward Greco-Roman culture and nothing unique to Jewish sages. Keep in mind that Stoics, Cynics, any number of sectaries, not to mention Christianity, all presented potential ideological threats to Rabbinism. The Epicureans did not proselytize and were barely active in Greco-Roman Palestine. So the reason for citing the Epicureans, the fellowship that valued ataraxia above all else, that is a life of tranquility without regard for fame or status, your sex or your birthright as a slave, cannot have been chosen because of some unique, unique belief held by that fellowship. Enough to say that this aphorism like the previous two we have studied, does not mean what it seems to mean on the surface. But our time is up. <laughs> Let me offer now brief concluding remarks. I like to think of ancient texts the way Henri Cartier-Bresson spoke of photography. Each photograph, according to Cartier-Bresson, could fix eternity through a moment. Our texts are like a photograph. No text is ever objectively motivate, an, an objectively motivated attempt to capture truth or wisdom. Just as a camera is aimed in one direction and not every direction, just as the lens closes out more than it actually captures, each document 
represents the constrained strivings of a given generation to make sense of the world. But the best it can do is offer a glimpse of a moment. For centuries, the dominant way to interpret Avot has been to assume its eternity, not as a moment captured, like a photograph, but as a work of wisdom literature that expounded eternal hidden truths. I quoted Jacob Neusner's sentiment earlier. The sages of Avot, he claimed, wrote for all time because they could transcend the cares and concerns of one time and place. Neusner's romantic concept of a text's enduring truth prevents us, prevents us from hearing the most pressing message offered by Avot, which might be best heard or might be best understood by looking at its form and method of exposition. Avot is poetry. Avot's authors consciously sidestepped the narrative discourse of philosophers, the rule-bound hermeneutics of Mishnah and early Midrash, the tumultuous dialectic of Gemara, and the Christian propensity for theological exegesis. A vote is poetry, and that means it entails all of the interpretive difficulties that are unique to poetic language of any given era. At least in the first three chapters, which are quite distinct from the latter three chapters, they are of much lesser quality, Avot's authors endeavored to capture in verse what others tried to write about in long treatises. There is nothing ordinary about Avot's language. Blackman was simply wrong. The, uh, these aphorisms were not written for common readers, and to decode the encoded meanings requires a deep familiarity with how the author understands the world and the characteristics of their literary form and representation. Moreover, one must know Hebrew, a language where at the moment of Avot's composition was not the dominant vernacular of Roman Palestine's population. Why Hebrew? That's a lecture for another time. In effect, the past 1700 years of reading a vote has forced a vote to perform according to genre rules that were not relevant to its purpose. A vote is a poetic manual of values targeted at the elite few who had the privilege to immerse themselves, to immerse their lives in a spiritual and intellectual world Judaism had not previously known. It constitutes a syncretistic cultural achievement, drawing from the avant-garde of its day and unabashedly rejecting the modalities, modalities of expression that had dominated Judaism up until that time. A vote is radical, and a vote is subversive. If there is a message for aspiring rabbis and scholars, I would say it is this. Rather than search for an eternal piece of wisdom or immortal truth, grapple, grapple with how each generation takes it upon itself to reformulate the questions and suggest answers. However, recognize that those answers are always tentative. It's true, not every generation performed this task equally, and that too should be a lesson. Look for the best poetry, the best philosophy, the best art, situate it in its world the best you can, and then make your act of interpretation its own art form. Interpretation is meaning-making, but interpreters can be conformist, even lazy, and meanings can become anachronistically conventional. I believe that is what has happened to a vote. In the last book of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, we read, everything is only for a day, 
both that which remembers and that which is remembered. The survival of a vote or any work of literature, including the meditations, may seem to violate the sense that things last but for a day. The same way Cartier-Bresson felt a photograph violated the ephemeral in daily life. Interpreters of literary works are those who bring about that kind of violation. One of the few contexts in which the word violate has so many positive connotations. Perhaps my interpretation this afternoon will inspire you to rethink your own relationship with this remarkable collection of aphorisms. But lest you think this an easy task, I will leave you with a paradox, which is, it, which is itself expressed in a vote, and which just happens to anticipate the last sentence of Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus by some 1700 years. Siag le chochma stika. Wofan man nicht sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen. The way to protect wisdom is through silence. Sometimes silence proves noisy. Thank you. A, a thousand thanks um, uh, for that uh, presentation. It was, um, a, it was exactly what I told you it would be, right? Uh, food for contemplation, um, uh, which we will all be doing for some time to come. However, for those of you who have been contemplating at the moment, um, I, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. You can field those. Sure. Okay. See, silence, you learned a lot. Um, so, regarding language, and one of the first uh, aphorisms you spoke about, if, if you're supposed to uh, follow the, the rub, and you said that it's not an allegory for God. So, how do you know when something in that book is supposed to be allegorical or when it's supposed to be? I actually wrote a book on that exact subject uh, called Biblical Ambiguities, and my concern in that book was. Um, how do you know when language is literal or figurative within biblical context? And actually, I wrote that book first on Bible because my original intention was to write it on Midrashic literature. And um, for certain reasons, I needed to develop a, a, a simpler theory of cognitive metaphor. And so why I decided it would be easier in Bible, I don't know. But I wrote that first, and I have dealt with that subject. This is, this is a profound issue. And one that scholars love to sidestep, right? They don't want to tell you um, how they make this decision because that way when they don't like a particular idea in a text, they're able to metaphorize it out of their discomfort. And when they do like a particular literal meaning, they're able to tell you that it's not figurative at all. So the politics of deciding whether something is figurative or literal is a serious problem within the academy. My approach was to try to find a cognitive theory of figurative language. And the cognitive theory of language, if I can give just a, in a, in a nutshell, deals with what Max Black called incongruence. And that is um, the moment we have a sentence which involves something we know isn't true at a literal level, we begin to look for its figurative meaning. So the classic example is all the world's a stage. If I say to you, is it true, all the world's a stage, you would say, of course not, the world is not a stage. So that means you need to go in search of non-literal meanings. The difficulty comes when you have an aphorism where it says Rav, and you have to decide whether a Rav there is God. And in that particular instance, I luck, thank goodness for computers, I searched the, wor the verb there is lishamesh, to serve the Rav. There is only one instance in all of rabbinic Judaism where someone serves God, and that is an angel. 
No human being is ever depicted in rabbinic literature with the verb lishamesh et harav as depicting God. So in that case, the justification for a figurative reading doesn't work. But if you understand avod is involved in this very sophisticated exchange ritual, and the rav is going to, you're, you're not to serve that rav for the pras. It was Louis Finkelstein, by the way, who first wrote about the word pras as not meaning prize. Um, then you realize all of these aphorisms are dealing with these human relations. Mm -hmm. A little question. A little question is the following. I am subordinating myself to a rock. What are my obligations? What are my material obligations in in that period? Yeah, those we can reconstruct. Um, only by analogy. We don't have that many explicit statements, but Seth Schwartz writes about this quite a bit. And we have numerous passages. There's very famous passages in Genesis Rabbah regarding Ben Zoma, where Rabbi Joshua is walking by with his collection of disciples who serve him. So exactly what they do is not altogether clear how they provide for him based on Greco-Roman elements it, it could have anything to everything to do with food preparation donations to the parties remember they're gathering these are mostly social events we shouldn't think of this is not an academy you're going to someone's house to hear a manuscript read it's unbelievably exciting so there are social elements that you show honor to the rav in the context of those social events. But more specific than that, I'm really not able. Maybe someone in the audience is more familiar with that than I, but I don't believe we have texts that permit greater specificity than that. And the big question? The big question is really, uh, it has to do with permanent you, know, you, have, you have established for me very convincingly that this is an elite text uh, and and yet it has come down to us. I mean, given the scholarship that you pretty much blown out of the water, um, as wisdom literature and wisdom literature for the common person. And that is how I have always understood, it, even though I have never you know, opened up every one of the aphorisms. Our Shakespeare is not Shakespeare's Shakespeare. Right. And and you know interpretation is such that each generation remakes it, remakes the text. The text has endured, and the text has endured if not for universal reasons, then at least because it has given meaning to each generation, even though the meaning has changed. So yeah, you're explaining to us what a vote meant to the writers of a vote. To the best of my the best ability. ability. Which I think is very good. But on Limited. The other hand, it doesn't necessarily um, uh, negate how we understand about and how it has come to be understood, you know, in, in the last few hundred years. Well, I, I, I did include a little line in there which said I would not be speaking about the reception history because that is a very distinct issue. And, and I love your reference. Hans Robert Yaus's concept of the horizon of expectations, which we all bring to a text. And the question, but you're you're really at a certain sense, you're asking a question about um, what is the value of historical critical analysis. And um, for a religious community, there may be many ways to approach that. For a scholarly community, this is my faith commitment. <laughs> so there's not really an issue. The fact that people will continue to misunderstand material is the same as them misunderstanding Shakespeare or Milton or Norman Finkelstein. It's a matter of, of productivity of the Yes, it does, right? If we want a, a strong misreading, as Bloom would say, then if you're that creative, Fabulous, but I would suggest that we don't really have very many good strong misreadings of a vote. They're mostly conventional and they rarely ever, I mean, it, I, I looked really hard. I looked really hard. Very rarely is there something that's a 
deep insight. But that's by judgment. I think Chaim and then Jason. Here's a confusion. The word Adam should be known. In that context, if I follow your um, your presentation of the did you see how badly Blackman translated? Yeah. So it seems it seems from what you are doing that the word Adam is not in first of it's a member of that group. So I, my my question is what constitutes Adam according to the book? Um, the one six. No, no, no. Okay. Really, the first one. Yeah. Okay. So, now we have to understand the word Adam in the context that he is not every human being. Well, how could it mean here? How could it mean every human being? No, no, I'm not telling you. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I'm following. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, and, and that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> the state farm. Um, and notice all men, yeah. which is, is really just a bad translation. But um, yes, I, I agree with you. The, the problem with Avot is none of the words mean what they seem to mean until you begin to recognize where they're drawing. They are, there is an amazing syncretistic document. Amazing. So, I, yes, great, a great point. I'm just talking about parallels. So uh, when I teach this text, in class, everyone applies the age and never have a parent. But when I talk about a woman being deep net, yeah, the purpose of marriage to share it. Well, but of course, everyone realizes that it's a real financial exchange. Yeah. But we're talking about fundamentally the same thing. It's absolute. The word here it is unequivocal. Again, Gabriel Herrmann's book deals with the older Greek material, but there it's time. I have a bibliography of dozens of articles that deal with what the function of this acquisition is. By the way, it was strongest in the military, the Roman military. You created these friendship relationships in order to, I'll watch your back, you watch my back. But what's interesting, some of the um, uh, some of the scholars have written about how they actually became friendships that were effective rather than pragmatic. So there's quite a bit written on this. There's a lot of literature on this. The fact that it's not in any commentary, despite you're correct, Jason, by bringing up Kiddushin, where Nicknate is absolutely unequivocal. Why is it? And it goes back to uh, Abigail's question. How do you know in that case that kene lecha chaver is literal? Because that's what it's about. That's what it's about. John. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I just thought that the, um, I, of course, am interested in the earlier predecessors to uh, what you're talking about. Um, and two questions. One is, to what extent does this economy of, of exchange were differently during the Greek era than the Roman era, and that he identified it all. Uh, and then, so then uh, and Sierra and other works like that come into play. The other is whether this army of King, particularly the way you identified it with the, the identity of the Rob and Master. The subordination, the economic exchange. Um, is there a history of that within Jewish wisdom literature that precedes the book? Yeah. Uh, to, to your first question, I have not studied it sufficiently to know. Um, or let me back up. If we look at um, Weber and Durkheim and others, um, all of religion would be framed as entailing exchange systems. So your question then as to whether there's historical continuity from the Second Temple period exchange systems to this rabbinic form of exchange, I have not myself studied sufficiently to give you an intelligent response. I would say that 
by reading a vote and looking at the contemporary Greco-Roman literatures, especially, you know, what's happening, and I deal this with this in the, the chapter on the Epicureans, they, they, um, they do seem to be aware of contemporary practices and whether one can identify a, con a continuity would take uh, a kind of research that I myself have not done. The second comment you had was about the, the whether it's Gre Greek or Roman. Yeah. 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 In terms of this form, I'm going to speculate that it is a syncretism with Greco-Roman culture. And when I, you know, last year we had a wonderful uh, dissertation done by Caleb Gilmore on uh, applying systems theory to the priestly worldview, which really is an analysis of the exchange system. And um, he did an amazingly detailed analysis of that. And I don't see anything there that then has a vestige in in later rabbinic thought and i would again i'm only speculating but i'm i'm remembering now some of us are studying together i mean like michael fishbane's book inner biblical uh on inner biblical exegesis on intertextuality or um biblical interpretation in ancient israel's 1985 book and he cautions at the end the last chapter is an epilogue where he cautions that seeing continuity, especially in Midrashic material, Agadic material, from Second Temple period through Rabbinic should be done with extreme caution. He personally, to this day, even in his book, Rabbinic Myth, uh, Biblical Myth and Rabbinic Mythmaking, he does not detect a continuity in those larger ideals. They're more local and time-bound. That's the best I can offer you. Yes, sir. I, uh so I couldn't resist. And this morning, no one has come to this. I read the first three chapters of those the bad Martin Japanese. And um, wow, coming to this, the impression I got this morning was boy, this is the biggest. Yeah. And to come to have you say that. And this well, Martin Jaffe, I, just, I don't, did he write the commentary or just the translation in that? It's Anderson. You know, so yeah. Well, he's one of those scholars who's quite aware of that. Does he acknowledge that elitism? It's been you know, three years since I've seen it. Now they have a little introduction there, headings. Sinek Cohen's the editor. He said, if you look at the Mishnah, the problem is there's no beginning, there's no end, there's just middle. You come into it, and that's why you're not a person. So that gives you those bearings. So that is there. I found the annotation to be kind of a hit and miss on how some put that. The wish were there, so I'm there. But my point here is I was reading one six, and I thought, what that third point is this experience? And you did this morning, and then you come, you explicated it, it makes eminent sense. Well, it's interesting that you said that. It, it, I show in my book, first, that the standard poetic form is a three-stitch aphorism. The third stitch always does something surprising. It is never what is expected. Well, this is too surprising. Yeah, well, sometimes, sometimes it is very surprising. But that is quite fascinating because... Um, they were aware, the poetics of the aphorism is aware of violating what comes before. You get something and you say, wait a minute, that's not what I expected, right? Even in phrases where it says, Al varim haolam omed, right? On three things, the world, and then you have three things and avodah is included. And you say to yourself, well, what is avodah? And that's supposed to be service as in temple worship. Why would you write that after the temple's fallen? So in a sense, they're transforming the world. Excuse me, they're transforming the word avodah by you cognitively being aware 
that there is no temple anymore. But every commentator, traditional commentator, notes that that is a pre-rabbinic, that comes from second temple period, so Avodah must point to the temple. Why would the rabbi say the world is sustained on three things and one of the three no longer is here? So you see, the coherence has to be part of the poetry. And that is often in the third stitch, which is violent. Well, I guess part. Maybe. Okay. One more quick thing. <clears throat> yes, yes. Oh, yeah. It's just the situation they're put in to be strangers from all over the country. You're, you're dependent on them, they depend on your advice and you want to Yeah. That creates that. Yeah, it's interesting. In Herman's book, he talks about military, he talks about politics. Because of the fear of being assassinated, he talks, he has all sorts of, there are many different usages for this exchange, but they are all elite. They're all part of the elite. Uh, it may have trickled down in some sense. We can't know that, but that's what the literature is written about. So, go ahead. Yes, sure. Uh, it's not my field, so I'll just toss it out. I mean, I really like the concept of this being an intellectual and cultural revolution. And I think, you know, it, it feels aphoristically, you know, it's a cultural revolution and you've got Hillel's Little Red Book, you know. And yeah. kind of, ah, ah, ah. But, the, but what's interesting is that, I mean, in one sense, it's a telecha, kinelecha, right? You're talking, it's addressed. Direct address. You're directing address to someone who's not in yet. Yes. Not inside yet. Yes. Right? But you're using it as a foil an intellectual system that's already like Epicureanism isn't part of the of at least the group that you're trying to convince to come into your right the, 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 no there's no there's no proselytizing to an Epicurean or a Stoic. No no this is an in you're trying to right you're using a it's an interesting who is it that you have singled out by this that you're using a, a an entire system that they're not into yeah, well, that's written about, I mentioned Marchetti, she, she writes beautifully about that issue. How did they get new members? And um, uh, she writes quite extensively, actually, I, if I remember correctly, about Alexandria in particular. And the key is you had to have certain qualifications to even approach this group. And... Um, uh, and you had to have recommendations. I mean, it was quite sophisticated. And we know in rabbinic literature, even, especially in uh, Tractate Eduyot, that the sage, that certain sages, their disciples were excluded from the larger group. And there's there are passages where you you are basically recognizing how much internecine conflict there is. I guess that's redundant, but there is so much conflict because um, you you were not happy about all of the admitted members, right? It's sort of Groucho Marx. If, if they would accept me as a member, why would I want to be a part of that group, right? So it's there. all of these issues are very tense. It is very complicated how you become a member. And the other element, which you mentioned, Jordan, the use of the second person, I have quite a bit of discussion of the discourse structure in a vote, which moves, which has third person, second person address, and it moves among different, there are even direct quotes, which is very strange for this, this book. So um, yeah, that, that whole issue is still much more to be written on that issue than I could possibly do in this study. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, the book will, the book will be out, I hope, in July.